welcome to medical so you just a quick reminder before we get started that uh, the please enter your questions in the chat and leave those for the end of the presentation and that uh, you can let us know that you were present at today's round by answering a brief survey that will be sent to you by medicine reception immediately after the medical grand rounds it is a great, great pleasure that i'd like to welcome our two guest speakers today coming to us from the departments of human genetics and oncology at mcgill university uh, the first speaker, known to many of us for many years, Dr. William Folks. He is a senior clinician scientist who has worked in the area of inherited susceptibility to cancer for over 25 years. His research career centers on underlying inherited susceptibility to cancer. Over the years, the direction of his program has been to move from cancer gene mutation discovery to clinical applications. This work is intimately associated with his clinical career. Over the years, he has supervised many undergrad and graduate students, as well as research and medical fellows. He has also developed a broad collaborative of network of clinical, pathological, and basic research experts with relevant specialties that are systematically involved in all aspects of his research program to complement his own expertise. Our second speaker today, Dr. Jean-Baptiste Rivière, PhD, is an assistant professor at McGill's Human Genetics and Clinical Molecular Geneticist at the MUHC. He is Associate Investigator of the RI of the MUHC and the Scientific Director of the RI MUHC's Bioinformatics Platform. He is specialized in identifying genetic alterations responsible for genetic diseases using next generation sequencing and associated bioinformatic tools and translating genomic technologies into clinical practice, both for rare diseases and for cancer. He has been working on genetic mosaics for over a decade since the early days of gen next generation sequencing. I'd like to welcome you both. Thank you very much for being here today at Medical Grand Rounds. And I'll ask Dr. Folks if he wants to start. Just checking, you can hear me okay? Perfect, thank you. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. So we're gonna do a joint presentation to myself and uh, Jean-Baptiste. So I'm gonna start um, uh, with a bit of introduction, uh, a case study of a, of a child we were involved with recently, and then, uh, JB will discuss some of his cases and then we'll have another section and then a finish. Okay, so when you when you when you hear the word uh, mosaic, you think uh, maybe not so much of uh, mosaicism um, in the genetic sense, but of mosaics uh, on on the uh, on on the wall. And here's a beautiful example of a um, mosaic created in the uh, 11, in the 12th century. Uh, by uh, by Roger 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 II in 1132 in the Palatine Chapel, and if you ever had a chance to go to uh, Palermo in Sicily, this is a, a truly wonderful uh, example of a mosaic, perhaps one of the greatest examples anywhere in the world. The whole chapel, actually, you can see this is the this is the uh, this is the, uh, the the ceiling, but the whole chapel, in fact, is covered in mosaics. So, what are the learning objectives for this talk? to be aware that mosaic mutations are not rare and contribute significantly to human disease, to recognize the usefulness of deep sequencing approaches to identify such variants, and to understand how some forms of mosaic mutations can complicate interpretation of germline variants. Uh, this is, for those of you who are more interested, this is a wonderful review from Leslie Bistek, who's done a lot of the original work, which uh, JB will talk about later. Uh, a wonderful review from Nature Review Genetics. And from that, I took the definitions. So a mosaic is an individual who developed from a single fertilized egg, but has two or more populations of cells with distinct genotypes. Whereas a chimera is multiple cell lineages derived from fertilized eggs. And we think of chimeras often in, in mythology of the, you know, the, the horse and the human, for example. Gonadal mosaicism is when um, diploid germ cell Curses in the good are in the good are heterogeneous. Some have the mutation, some don't. Whereas somatic mosaicism is when it's outside of the outside of the germ cells, and obviously you can have both, which we then call gonos, gonosomal mosaicism. And here's an example of these. So this is gonosomal in the middle. Uh, here's somatic mosaicism not affecting the gonads, and here's gonadal mosaicism just the gonads. The problem here, of course, is that the phenotype will be absent in this person, but it is transmissible, and we'll come on to that issue later on. So um, essentially, um, 
I don't know what's happened quite here, but essentially mutations happen early. So um, the point is, is that even at the first cell division, there's going to be mutations happening uh, in, in some cells. So the derivatives, the daughter cells uh, from that original zygote will not have an equal representation of mutations. And this has been, this is, this is a, a schematic vision version, but here's a sort of a real version of uh, a study done, published in Nature some years ago, when you can see you start off with the most recent common ancestor of blood cells is, is, is shown here at the top. But by the time you get down to uh, the, generation here in the fourth generation you can see that that there's, there's a very unequal contribution of mutations to the blood pools 70 percent here will have this particular mutation whereas 30 percent won't and you can break these obviously further down as more mutations are required so you can see we're basically all mosaics uh, right from the start and of course this has been known in clinical medicine for years uh, those of you who remember their anatomy blaschko's lines uh, really is an example of mosaicism, uh, which was kind of rediscovered by the um, by the um, German um, dermatologist Rudolf Happel, who is sort of the father of this whole field, and has published this book here uh, on mosaicism in human skin. He noticed it uh, in dermatology, and of course that's where it was first apparent for obvious reasons. And JB will talk, talk to you more about type one and type two. So um, it's basically a recent field, although. We've known about mosaicism for years. It's only been recognized recently because of the ability to, to sequence deeply. And his hypothesis initially, Happel's hypothesis, was that was that lethal mutations could survive by mosaicism. And this has really been fairly well proven, at least part of this hypothesis has been proven uh, by uh, next generation sequencing. Here's an example of just one T uh, in a run here. Uh, it's a T here, you can see the total count is 21,000, uh, the nine Cs, uh, four, uh, four couldn't be called. So you can see the, the everything, you know, the mutations are not represented evenly yeah, in that tissue. So it turns out the post mutations mutations are, um, are not the exception, they're actually the rule, because you need 10 to the 60 mitosis to generate an adult. And uh, if you have 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the min minus 7 detectable post psychotic mutations per nucleotide, you can imagine that uh, we're all going to acquire a, a very large number of these um, mosaic mutations. So in other words, genetic mosaicism is, is the norm rather than the exception. And the question is how many and where? It really determines the uh, clinical phenotype. So the challenges um, are that even for monogenic syndromes, uh, the timing in the cell lineage are affected by the mutation, and the, therefore the recognition of the syndrome and syndrome delineation can be can be difficult, uh, particularly when you when you don't know whether you're even finding the mutations, because when you sequence blood, you may see nothing, but you need to find these mutations to prove causality. So you're left with some uncertainty in, in this situation. But um, and, and when the allele frequency is very, very low, then it can be difficult to distinguish a real variant from a, a sequencing error. Uh, just to give you a sense of timing, you can see that you know, if it's gonadal mosaicism, then it will be a full-on germline mutation, um, essentially de novo, um, equivalent to a de novo mutation occurring at fertilization. And then of course, the later they occur, uh, in life, the, the, more, the more restricted the pattern is, such that eventually, uh, essentially, they occur only in cancers. So, you know, cancer is a mosaic a disorder, if you'd like. Uh, and even within cancers, of course, there are multiple cell lineages. So what are the molecular mechanisms? Well, you can have large-scale chromosomal uh, abnormalities, you can have copy number variation, you can have point mutations and small insertions and deletions. All of these can contribute to mosaicism. Just to give you a bit of a clinical flavor of this, here's some well-known uh, dermatological phenotypes. So uh, first of all, uh, here you have uh, you have NF1, of course, here, uh, segmental NF1, here in the first picture. Uh, this is um, this is acrodermatitis vericoformis uh, caused by an ATP2A2 mutation. This is the so-called so cerebriform sole of the foot uh, caused by AKT mutations causing Proteus syndrome. This is a, um, a facial dysmorphism caused by a PI3 kinase uh, mutation in Cloves syndrome, which was thought originally to be a type of um, a variety of uh, Cowden syndrome, until, uh, of, of um, Proteus syndrome until the mutations were found. And this of course is Sturge-Weber caused by mosaic mutations to the G GNAQ. 
present in the skin and of course in the brain. So context is everything, because if you get the same mutation in a different place, you get a different phenotype. It's a beautiful paper from, um, uh, from uh, Francesco uh, Real from uh, CNI, CNIO, where he showed uh, that an HRAS mutation uh, could cause both urothelial cancer and an epidermal nevus in the same person. So here's the epidermal nevus, here's the KRAS mutation. That by itself is not a cancer, but when you put the KRAS mutation, put the HRAS mutation into the bladder, uh, you get a bladder cancer, but of course you need other mutations to get the bladder cancer. So in the skin, it's just one mutation, whereas in the bladder, it's, it's HRAS followed by other mutations with it, which then lead to bladder cancer, but it's, a, it's like a sort of the, the, the originating uh, gatekeeper variant. So um, that's an example from the literature. Here's an example from our own work. Uh, just published recently in the Journal of Medical Genetics. Uh, I'll tell you first a bit about DISA to make sense of this story. So uh, DISA mutations um, uh, essentially occur in the gene DISA shown here, and uh, it's involved in microRNA processing. Uh, what actually happens is when you, in a normal situation, you, you process a precursor microRNA, which is exported from the nucleus, and then you cut it, you dice it, uh, into these two um, arms, the 3P and the 5P arm, and then one of them, the 5P or the 3P is loaded. Uh, the 3P, the 5P is loaded by, cut by the, the, the RNH3B, and the, uh, the 3P um, arm is cut by RNH3A. So in Dyce syndrome, what happens is a, a, a very specific mutation here takes out RNH3B cutting, so you end up with this the loop structure such that only the three Ps are bound and the five Ps essentially disappear. So you end up with a, with a big shift in your microRNA profile. And this results in a uh, syndrome, including some very, very rare tumors like pituitary blastoma, where there are less than 20 cases worldwide, but also things like multinodular goitre that's extremely common. But most of, the, most of the features occur in childhood and are all very rare, and some of them actually only really occur in Dyce syndrome. What's very interesting is that the spectrum of mutations, as I mentioned, the, 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 the somatic mutations all occur in this metal iron binding domain in 3B, RNH3B shown here, whereas germline mutations can occur anywhere. So you could sh you should be able to find these just by sequencing the entire gene. And this just show you what the actual structure looks like. Here's the three and the three B. And then what happens is that region there is involved in cutting the precursor, as I mentioned, into two parts: the five P, the hook, and the three P. Uh, and then one or other of the two microRNAs will be loaded uh, and then suppress. Um, messenger RNA or completely eliminate RNA uh, production. So where does mosaism come in? Well, this is an example of four children that we were investigating who we would have put a lot of money on this being caused by Dyson syndrome. They have absolutely typical features. They're all diagnosed very young. But one thing you will notice in both of these cases is the extremely large number of different um, um, disorders occurring. It's not just one tumor. These children have multiple tumors, very, very unusual. Nine primary lesions before age 18 in this uh, young woman. And in the next slide, you can see five lesions. This child has probably only two lesions, uh, a PPB uh, pleural blastoma on the left, uh, on the left and the right, one of which turned into a uh, an outright cancer. So the cysts are actually malignant, but you don't usually treat them except by removing them. They're on both sides. So this child, it's not so certain the child is mosaic because he only has two lesions, but for the others, it's, uh, it's certain that they have Dyson syndrome. So um, one thing in common was that we couldn't find a, a germline mutation on Sanger sequencing. So then we sequenced the tumors and uh, we got a surprise in that all the tumors in each child had the same mutation, which is a mutation in 3B, which is unexpected because 3B mutations are not found in the germline. So we thought, well, this is interesting. They all have the same mutation. It obviously can't be acquired in all these children in the same, it, the same uh, mutation can't be identified uh, in all different tissues. They would be different mutations if they were, if they were purely arising in the tumor. Uh, another child had a different mutation and so on and so forth. So within each tumor, the mutation was the same. And then we realized that kind of the penny dropped, oh, it's not the tumor we're sequencing, it's actually the normal that essentially is being represented. So the children we realized were mosaics and that all these tumors actually had second hits in RNA, in, outside of RNH3B, that was the, uh, 
the, the second hit required for the tumors to develop. Just to take a note of this child, again, the right, the right lung cyst and the left BPB both had, uh, had the same uh, RNH3B mutation, but it was not present in the blood. You can see very tiny blips, but not present in the blood. So we thought, well, we better um, investigate this more deeply. So we worked with Yanis Ragusis and with uh, Agilent to create a new technology, uh, an adaptation of Haloplex called Haloplex HS, which allowed us to barcode um, uh, the sequences so we could reject uh, false sequences, which are common in this kind of sequencing, and accept only the true mutation. Uh, and therefore, you can kind of get a, a more accurate representation of how, how frequent all these uh, variants actually are without uh, doing any PCRs, which distorts obviously the allele frequencies. Uh, so this, what, this, what this found when we did this was that we had, um, we could see the mutations actually in saliva in, in child one, it may be present in child two, clearly present in child three, but child four, there was zero, absolutely nothing. No mutations seen on, on very deep sequencing. So we wondered what was going on here. Was this really mosaic? Well, um, this is, the value of following up with uh, with the family. The family got in touch with us. Though, by the way, uh, the child has just been diagnosed with a goiter. So we thought, oh, well, that's interesting. So now the child has a, has a lesion outside of the lung, and so we we were able to get hold of this goiter, <clears throat> and it, we found that it had the same eighteen oh nine R mutation in the thyroid lesion as was seen in the lung, and they had second hits, another hot spot or a truncating mutation in the MNG. You can show that here. Here's the second hit. This is actually a, a, a 3B hit. So this goiter actually has two 3B hits. Uh, and there were second hits, um, which I'm not showing you here, in the lung tumors uh, as well. So we had the classic model of two hits. It's just in this case, the first mutation is a 3B mutation that's mosaic. So then that got us thinking about, uh, you know, what was the real frequency. Uh, and at the operation, we'd ask the surgeon to send us some tracheal aspirate and also to take a skin biopsy from the incision over the neck. And you can see the skin has absolutely no mutations in 10,000 reads. The tracheal aspirate has two reads, that's probably real at that frequency. And as you can see the lung and, this, and the MNG uh, and, uh, and the thyroid cystic nodules all have representations of this G809R mutation as does the positive control. So we're now pretty sure this child is a mosaic negative in blood, negative. The urine didn't really work, as you can see, but the blood worked. So um, we wondered when this mutation could have happened. So um, previously, as you showed you, the found cases one, two, and three, they had widespread distribution of, 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 of the disorders. So the mutation is probably present in all three germ layers. Whereas in this child, this person has mutations only in the, has disease only in the lung, and in the thyroid gland. So we wondered when it could have occurred. We thought well, it must have happened after gastrulation, which is when the three layers are, are derived, um, because otherwise it would be present in other tissues, including the blood. So then we thought, well, hang on a minute, it's present in both lungs. Well, we know the lung vification occurs at day 26. So we think the mutation must have occurred between day 18 and day 26. And the only tissue that it could have occurred in is foregut endoderm. Uh, and I'll come on to that in, in a minute. So what we think is happening, for example, in, in, in the thyroid goiter is that the HDO9 is present in all the tissues. That's the, that's the mosaic mutation. And then the second hit occurs in one nodule. So you get a nodule here, that's the three B hits here. In another nodule, you get a truncating mutation. So different nodules will have different second hits, but they all have the HDO9 variant. So just to go back to the sense of, of timing, so uh, here's mesoderm, and so here's day 16, here's day 18, here's mesoderm, here's ectoderm. So endoderm divi is divided into, um, um, meso mesoendoderm is divided into endoderm and mesoderm. Mesoderm gives you the blood. So there's no there's zero counts in the blood and there was zero counts in the next skin. So it's not in ectoderm, it's not in mesoderm. So it must be an endoderm. There were no midgut or hindgut phenotypes. So we can't rule out the possibility it's also is present in those tissues and we haven't seen it yet. But given the disorder presents mainly in childhood, this seems unlikely. But um, so then we do see it in the thyroid gland. We do see it in the lung. So we think the mutation happens somewhere uh, along this scale between day 18 and day 26. And you can see based on the right-hand side, essentially the tissues developing in a human. And you predict that he might get, for example, um, a liver cyst, but at the age, um, 
the person is now, it seems less likely based on the literature that you will get these problems. But I suppose we better watch out just in case there's an issue for stomach polyps or, or a liver cyst, which would be, you know, potential dice related phenotypes. So I'm going to stop here uh, and uh, stop sharing my screen and let uh, uh, John Baptiste now take over and give you a little bit more insight, a bit more detailed insight into disorders of the uh, uh, M, M, uh, the um, mTOR pathway. Can you see my screen? Yeah. That's very good, thank you. All right, so you saw this picture here uh, before. Uh, so as we mentioned, uh, mosaicism was first described and known in the skin. Um, it was really rediscovered by Rudy Hapo, a German dermatologist in the 80s. At the time, he formulated a, a series of hypotheses that uh, most of which remain uh, true today. One of which is the idea of lethal genes uh, surviving only by mosaicism. So the only way you, you can have a human being surviving with some mutations will be by being mosaic. This has only been proven recently. And the other idea, one of the many hypotheses he formulated, is the, the types of mosaicism, either type 1 or type 2 mosaicism. Type 1 is a postzygotic mutation, which is heterozygous in a number of cells in a normal background. Type 2 mosaicism is when you have one allele which is affected by a germline mutation. So the, the mutation is heterozygous and present in all the cells of the body. And on the other allele, in some cells, um, you have a postzygotic mutation. So it, it's a bit like the uh, two-hit model uh, in cancer. So until recently, all these ideas had not been proven. These were only hypotheses. And it's only really with the emergence of next-gen sequencing that we were able to go after um, small mutations, so point mutations or small indels that were mosaic simply because we didn't have technology before that. So the, the, the first uh, example of the successful use of next generation genomics in the field of mosaicism was the study on the well-known uh, Crotus syndrome. The idea there, so it was in 2010, 2011, um, by the group at the NIH was to sequence uh, resection samples, DNA extract from resection samples of patients with Crotus syndrome and to compare the genome of these affected tissue with the genome of the blood samples of the same patients using pairs, a bit like what we do in cancer. And strikingly, all the tissue, all the affected tissue, all the patients that were uh, tested had the exact same mosaic mutation in AKTY. So a number of lessons uh, have been derived from this first you know, proof of concept study. So first, the, the power of next generation genomics for going after these uh, syndromes that were untractable using conventional methods, provided that one has the good experimental design, provided that we have access to affected tissue uh, to be able to detect such events that may not be present in, in the blood. Some of the characteristics of the, the mutation found in Protevis apply to many other mosaic syndrome we've identified since then. So first, these are in, in many, um, for many diseases, these are hotspot mutations that are typically gain of function, activating variants in signaling pathways. Many are known somatic driver mutations in sporadic cancer. So the same mutation you find in AKT1 in Proteus can also be found uh, in a, a sporadic adult cancer. Uh, the only difference is the timing when the mutation occurred. Depending on the tissue tested, we can see greatly variable levels of mosaicism. 
and often these mutations are not detectable in blood. So it also supported the idea the, of uh, lethal mutation surviving only by mosaicism, because we have yet to see an individual alive with a germline variant in AKT1 at that amino acid. So later on, following that first paper, uh, other groups, including us, have identified other prozygotic mutations, also mainly activating, also mainly known hotspot mutations in cancer in a series of overgrowth uh, syndromes with the clinical presentation and the severity uh, varying depending on when and where uh, the mutation would occur uh, during development. So to give you some illustrative examples, uh, a group identified postzygotic PIK3CA mutations in closed syndrome same kind of mutations we could find in either hemimegalencephaly, uh, so overgrowth of part of the brain uh, with no other phenotype than uh, a brain phenotype, or megalencephaly capillary malformation, or if the mutation occurs later during development, isolated macrodactyly. If we focus on the, the work on, on brain samples, so th this is a good example of uh, requiring uh, material from resection for doing genomic studies. So here, um, the researchers had access to part of the brain after brain surgery to try to treat intractable uh, seizures that were intractable to, to treatment. And the, the mutations that were identified in this patient specifically were isolated to the brain. So there was no way to detect such mutations without having access to brain tissue. The same kind of postzygotic mutations specific to the brain, if they occur uh, later during brain development, will not lead to half of the brain to be overgrown, but will lead to focal cortical dysplasia. Uh, which is, a, as, as you already know, a, a common cause of severe epilepsy. So when we have access to brain samples of patients who underwent brain surgery for treating FCD, and then we sequence these samples, we can detect postzygotic mutations in mTOR, in P3CA, in AKT3, uh, which won't be detectable in the blood samples of the same patients. Just to give you an overview of all the prosaic mutations found in the pathway, this is a, an illustration quite simplified of the PI3K AKT mTOR signaling pathway with the main effectors of the pathway. In red, you have the activators. Here, P10 is the main inhibitor of the pathway. And uh, it's a pathway that drives a lot of cell processes including growth, proliferation, survival, migration, uh, metabolism, uh, etc. It's also a well-known pathway in brain development, uh, in, in, uh, in brain development and in uh, cancer development. So depending on which gene is affected and which type of mutation, when and where the mutations occur, you, you have this large spectrum of overgrowth uh, syndromes. Here, P10, so all of them, all the, all the prosaic mutations in the activators of the pathway are type 1 mosaicism. These are many activating mutations. For uh, P10 here, heterozygous mutations in P10 at the germline level lead to Cowden syndrome. But if you have type 2 mosaicism, so a, a second hit that is prosaic on the other allele, uh, the phenotype is called Solamen and it resembles Proteus syndrome. What's been fascinating about you know, these overgrown uh, syndromes is that uh, given the recent development in, in targeted therapies in cancer, and due to the nature of the mutations, these are mainly activating mutations, there were uh, drugs out there uh, that were at different levels of, of development in the field of oncology. So pretty rapidly, from the discovery of these genes and mutations in these rare overgrown, uh, overgrowth uh, syndromes, um, 
researchers were able to implement uh, the first clinical trials, many of which are ongoing if you go on, on clinical trials uh, that, that go. So it, it's a good example of a drug repurposing and treating rare genetic diseases, which is rather uh, rare. Now I'm gonna move to a, another example, a completely other example from a, an MUHC patient um, to talk about PTPN11 and mosaicism. So just to give you some background, PTPN11 is the main gene causing Noonan syndrome. So heterozygous germline mutations in, in that gene uh, will cause uh, Noonan syndrome. Here, uh, this was a nine month old child with GMML. Uh, seen by MUHC Genetics by uh, Daniela D'Agostino, and for whom a hereditary leukemia panel at Blueprint uh, was ordered on the blood sample. And Blueprint, the, the clinical labs in the US, reported, among other things, a pathogenic uh, mutation in the PTPN11 uh, gene found in roughly 30% of alleles. So if the variant was to be germline, we would expect a 50% to 50-50 ratio, which wasn't the case. So what they reported was a variant that was likely to be um, mosaic. So then the, the, the clinical team followed up and sent out a buccal swab, which came back negative, as well as, as DNA from uh, the skin, a skin punch which fa failed at Blueprint due to a small amount of, of DNA. So that's where we were involved, the clinical lab at the MHC. We, we took this, um, this uh, DNA derived from the skin, and we did uh, here ultra deep sequencing of, of the variant that was originally detected in blood. And we were able, you know, by that method, by deep sequencing of the region of interest, we were able to identify the mutation in 2% of alleles in the skin sample, confirming the posigotic nature uh, of the mutation. So this is not a mutation that occurred randomly and, and gave GMML. The mutation was actually, is actually uh, a mosaic for uh, that variant. So um, when asking the clinical team about the, the skin phenotype, it was noted that the skin was unremarkable except one catheole spot and capillary malformation. And interestingly enough, we had attended a, a talk of a colleague dermatologist at, at UCL who's been working for the last decade on mosaicism. Her name is Veronica Kinsler, and she does have a cohort of nine patients, all with a um, mosaic skin phenotype called PPV, Phacomatosis pigmentovascularis, which is a combination of pigmentary and vascular uh, skin anomalies. You can see here uh, picture A, that's a photo from uh, Veronica Kinsler's team, the, the mosaic pattern in, in Chico board, uh, for example. And so the, the, the nine patients all had posiolic PTPN11 variants, all of which had been shown to be to lead to an overactivation of the MAP kinase pathway, just as our uh, variant. Uh, and they had different levels of uh, extracutaneous features at different salaries, uh, including developmental delay for two of them and musculoskeletal anomalies for others. Two of them had a story of cancer, one melanoma, another one has a neuroblastoma. So, pretty much the same phenotype as our patients with a ascertainment bias from Veronica Kinsler's team, since she's a dermatologist and the, the phenotype of the skin of her patients was, was much more severe than our uh, patients. The conclusion from this story is that uh, a, 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 um, a childhood cancer, which might look uh, sporadic, can actually be the expression of a mosaic phenotype. Here, what we have is a mosaic rasopathy, plus or minus features that we will see in Noonan syndromes, depending on when and where the mutation occurs. 
it does have impact on clinical management uh, because you know depending on, on the severity of the phenotype um, the patients may need multi-system evaluation um, as for Noonan syndrome and there is also lifelong increased risk for hematologic or solid tumor uh, malignancies. There is also an impact for genetic counseling. These patients themselves have a risk of developing cancer, but they could have gonosomal mosaicism, and therefore the risk of passing on the variant to their uh, children, which will lead to a full-blown uh, Noonan uh, syndrome. So I'm going to let Will finish our presentation. Stop sharing. I hope that's what can you see of my screen now? <laughs> yes, we can. Yeah. Is that OK? Yep. Yeah. Yes, we Great. Can. Thank you. So um, a special form uh, of mosaicism um, can complicate MS and germline invariance in, in sort of more um, traditional adult medicine. I want to focus in the last few minutes on something that's perhaps a bit closer to the heart of many people in the Department of Medicine, which would be adult medicine. And the fact that there's this sort of subtype of somatic mosaicism called clonal hematopoiesis, also called clonal hematopoiesis of intermittent potential, or CHIP, or ARCH. I quite like the names you can remember. I suppose ARCH is quite good. Um, age related clonal hematopoiesis. They're all a little bit different in their definitions, but essentially you, you have to have, a, you, you can't have a hematological neoplasm. You have to have a normal peripheral blood count. You can't have paroxysmal nocturnal hematuria or some kind of well-known, you know, well-known uh, disorder caused by um, some kind of clonal abnormality. And you have to have a variant allele frequency of greater than 2%. And you saw, saw in, in, in JB's talk there, it was 2% was the, was the cutoff. And so um, that's, you know, otherwise it could just be a random, a random error. And essentially Arch just points out the fact that they get, that you get more of them, you get older, and I'll come on to that. So essentially clonal hematomysis for large chromosomal abnormalities, that's, if you remember earlier, I talked about chromosomal abnormalities as well as point mutations as well as copy number variants. So large chromosomal family are actually quite common, 2% of elderly people, and they're a risk factor for later hematological malignancies. And point mutations can also be associated with cancer later in life. In a recent study, 40% of, of Japanese men over 80 had some form of um, chip or arch. So it's really, it's really sort of almost becomes more expected to have such a thing as you get older. And you can see from the, uh, from the image here, the allele frequencies are very, very low. Um, so you have to have special techniques for finding them, which JD was telling you about. Interestingly, not all genes are equally susceptible. Um, for example, you know, DMT3A is a classical um, uh, methylation gene that's very frequently mutated. But in fact, other genes like JAK2 are well known, but other genes are more well known for their involvement in hereditary cancer or, or certainly in somatic um, development of tumors such as B53, IDH2 is a brain tumor and AML gene, and ATM, of course, we think of as mainly as a breast cancer gene, and of course, the cause of ataxia langectasia in children. So, just to give you a sense of um, what happens over the course of a, the life of a clone, so you have the normal stem cell, and then what happens is that you can sort of you can recapitulate the history by, by, by essentially studying the mutations. So they can work out from starting from, from here and from here that this, um, that this was the first mutation in P53 occurring in a normal, in a normal cell. Then what happened with that caused some expansion of that clone. And then one of the clones had a del, del 5Q, which is a well-known phenomena, which caused that cell to, 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 to proliferate, to, had a competitive advantage compared to other cells. And then it had loss of heterozygosity of P53 at chromosome 17. So again, another advantage, it starts to take off here. And then finally, you get the complex uh, keratote, which completely messes up the cell and it becomes, uh, becomes a leukemia. But this is sampling at 34 months before diagnosis. They were able, in this study from Sweden, of 12,000 men uh, and women, they were able uh, to spot that these abnormalities were present before the cancer was present. So this is sort of starting off with one mutation and taking you through. But what's interesting and perhaps surprising is that 
clonal hematopoiesis actually is not even mainly related to hematological cancer risk. Uh, the main risk is actually cardiovascular disease, uh, where there's a 40% increase in cardiovascular disease if you have CH. Uh, and that's because the cells end up floating around um, your, your blood system and end up getting impacted into, the, in, into arterial and venous walls and produce factors which lead to increased atherosclerosis, for example, um, and thrombosis. But it's actually, as you see, more common. And in this current time of COVID, you, you maybe would be surprised to know that people with COVID actually have a greater uh, proportion of CH amongst the uh, great, greater risk. If you have CH, you have a greater risk of COVID complications. And it seems to be involved in, a, in fact, a whole diverse type of infection, including uh, pneumonia. So um, you might say, well, you know, coming back to the start, what controls CH? Well, it turns out CH, of course, is under genetic regulation. And uh, interestingly, DNA damage repair genes such as MER11, NBN, and ATM, which I mentioned earlier, are actually all are all implicated in, in, in your risk of getting CH in the first place. So sort of a polygenic risk score type approach is identified 156 different variants in the, ge in the genome, which increase your risk for getting um, CH. And some of these variants actually are, are, are in genes. MER11 is actually a truncating mutation in MER11A that seems to be associated with an increased risk for CH. Um, so in other words, get used to it, because mosaicism is the new normal. Um, why worry? Well, if you have a Y chromosome, you might worry because you're going to lose it as you get older. And you can see here that this is from 200,000 um, people, in, uh, males in the UK biobank study. You can see that if you're 70, you have a 45 percent chance of having significant Y chromosome loss. And you say, OK, well, OK, so that's men. Uh, women don't have a Y chromosome, so obviously this can't be linked to anything in women. Well, you'd be wrong because mosaic loss of chromosome Y is controlled by autosomal genes, which of course women have, and lo and behold, uh, the same genes which increase the risk for uh, loss of Y increase your risk for breast, ovarian, uh, and endometrial cancer, as well as, as prostate cancer in males. So it's really taking on a completely different flavor here now. Uh, this is sort of going from something that we can forget about because it affects people who, you know, who have these problems very early in life to essentially affecting everybody. So essentially, mosaicism um, is, is found in everybody. And it's just a question of when and where does it happen? And this is a wonderful paper that I got this data from, published uh, a, few, a few years ago uh, in, 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 in Nature. So, um, you know, as this is JB put together this beautiful collection of papers, there's papers coming out almost every, every week showing how normal tissues contain mutations, and it's the, it will complicate it. As you can imagine, early diagnosis of cancer, if you have mutations in normal tissues, then finding a P53 mutation uh, is not sufficient. P53, having a P53 mutation in your blood does not mean you have cancer at all. Uh, it means uh, that you've sampled some cell that had a P53 mutation, and uh, that may not have significance. So uh, um, I just summarize now and finish by saying that uh, essentially museum is present in every tissue, whether you can find it or not, and it can be present in any gene. The levels of mosaicism change with age and with selection pressure. I mean, I didn't, we didn't go on about that too much, but uh, if you think of what JB's example, you have a 2% allele frequency in the skin biopsy, uh, but a 29% frequency uh, in the blood, it's almost certain that that was selected for um, because it actually gave a blood cell a, an advantage where it didn't give a skin cell an advantage. So mosaicism is the norm, and the same mutations can cause rare syndromes and common disorders which just as we've been showing you uh, in the last few slides. So what we learn from this lesson is that obviously it makes, uh, it makes genetics very interesting, more challenging, particularly in the lab, but it does help us to understand the full genotype free type spectrum, which we're beginning to understand is of course far more complicated than we thought. And it allows us to see the broad spectrum of mutations. Uh, it provides a model system, but will force us to think uh, more carefully about diagnosis. Uh, and will force us to integrate uh, uh, sort of the, both the molecular and the phenotype into a taxonomy of disease, which is sort of both based on the mutations identified, but also the phenotype, because obviously the context of a P53 mutation uh, says everything. The mutation is important, but it's clearly not enough 
And that HRS example from uh, Francesca Riel um, showed how the you know, HRS in the skin is very different to HRS in the bladder. So I think I'll stop there and we will take some questions uh, if there are any. Yes, thank uh, you. Uh, thank you very much for this fascinating, fascinating work and fascinating presentation. Um, yes, we do have a few questions coming in. So thank you for that. So Dr. Rosenblatt wants to know, does the extent of mosaism vary among species and does it correlate with lifespan length of the species? I'm sure you can answer that, JP. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I believe, I don't, I, I'm not aware of any recent study using next generation sequencing to try to answer that question. This might have been done before using uh, chromosomal methods. Uh, you know, mosaicism is, is, has been studied for decades at the level of chromosomes with cytogenetic studies. So I, I could answer that question, but I guess it should. I mean, the uh, that's the main uh, phenomenon driving aging. So. Yeah, there was an interesting study that just came out in Nature Genetics looking at Pol E. So polymerase e epsilon increases the mutation um, rate uh, in people. Uh, so you find more mutations in people in their in their normal tissue. So Pol E is associated with cancer, a type of um, it's called pol uh, uh, polymerase proofreading associated polyposis. And I'll just say that, but it's a type of polyposis is the main phenotype. Uh, the people also get other types of tumors, but mainly colon polyps. So when they sequenced normal tissue from individuals with poly mutations, they found there were there were many more mutations than expected in the in individuals, but nobody aged faster. So yeah. mutations per se aren't enough. It goes back to the point about the CH is the context. If if the if the mutations occur in certain genes at certain times, you know, you it could result in illness and disease, but not necessarily a phenotype of aging, such as the classical uh, signs that you see in people like with Werner's, uh, Werner's syndrome, for example. Right. And in addition to that, as we showed with the Y chromosome, we can imagine at some point a genomic assay that, that would go after mosaic uh, clonal mutations, and which could be a biomarker of, of the, the, the risk or a number of, of complex diseases. Yeah, and a number of places have started uh, CH clinics now. Um, Sloan Kettering has a CH clinic. Ross Levine um, has started a CH clinic at Sloan Kettering. And now um, um, I'm just blanking on her name, but she, uh, she published, uh, Kelly Bolton published, uh, she worked with Ross. Um, Levine has now gone to Wash U and she's starting a CH clinic. So I think there's quite a lot of interest in the idea of um, tracking this in, in, in individuals, it's, 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 it, I mean, it's sort of also kind of slightly worrying because obviously many people, you won't necessarily know what disease they might develop and are you going to scan people for everything kind of thing. But the fact that, you know, that the risk for heart, for heart disease is so much greater for the CH does make you wonder whether in fact we ought to be prioritizing people who have CH for early investigations, early interventions, and perhaps some form of preventive therapies. Thank you. Along those lines, uh, when do you work backwards? So you have a patient with heart failure, you have a patient with atherosclerotic disease that's unexpected or thrombosis. When do you work backwards and say, could this be CH? And it, would it change the management? Um, well, I suppose you could. I mean, I guess you could work back on everybody. I mean, there's no, there's no, I, I don't know whether you could make a cutoff of what age you would be particularly, you know, if they were, if they were younger, might they have be more likely to have a CH contribution. Um, but I, I don't think anybody's really studied that. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not that up on cardiovascular genetics. And I may be, be, be saying something that's incorrect, but I don't think people have studied that yet. Um, it's relatively new in the last couple of years that the cardiovascular phenotype has emerged. Um, in terms of what could you do about it? I mean, again, that's, that's a great question. Because I suppose, I mean, the presentations will be the same. I mean, they'll, it'll look like ordinary heart disease. So whatever you do for ordinary heart disease, you would do or cardiovascular disease, or you know, uh, you would you would do for these patients. It's just that you might, you might you might be able to. Um, I mean, I don't know whether you could do anything to eliminate the clones. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, probably not, but I don't know. 
Yeah, I don't know whether you could eliminate the clones. I suppose it's possible, but they're not actually malignant clones. So I don't know, you know, you, you, you'd, they're coming out of the bone marrow or the, or the progenitor cells. So they're going to be present in the bone marrow. I'm not sure you'd be able to easily track them. Um, JB, have you got any thoughts on that? No. no. Okay, so when, at this point in time, it would not be worth trying to find out is basically what you're saying, because there's nothing you would do about it in your case. Um, well, I wouldn't say there's no point in doing it. I, I just not quite sure. It would be, I think it would be good to know actually, to get a handle on actually how common is the problem, you know, uh, and and how prevalent is it? And uh, are there phenotypes? Like we know smoking, for example, increases CH. There's a number of risk factors um, which are well established. Um, but clearly the advantage would be more likely to be in the other direction, as you, as you kind of imply, finding it first and then uh, trying to intervene to prevent the, the likely complications of CH rather than finding somebody with the complication. And then, uh, I mean, it's a bit like finding a, you know, finding an ovarian cancer and saying, let's find a BRC1 mutation. Very good, but they've got ovarian cancer. So it's helpful, but not, not as helpful as, as finding it before they get the cancer. Well, you should consider doing research with the cardiologist because there are no, I mean, there isn't a lack of patients. There are many patients. Yeah, right. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, Arnie Christoph wants to know any idea why Dyster 1 mutations lead to cystic pathology? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I've struggled with that for a long time because it's very striking. Um, I mean, I suppose the short answer, if we didn't have much time, would be no. I don't really have any ideas. Um, I mean, it's, I, I guess it's, it must be something to do with the microRNA profile that's created by the dice mutations. If we assume that the, prof, that the syndrome is really entirely driven by the microRNA shift, which may not be entirely true. I mean, dice, as it turns out, is present in the nucleus. I showed you it present in the cytoplasm, but actually it's, it's present in the nucleus and seems to have a role in DNA damage repair. So, you know, I, I, we are lacking some key facts here. But um, the cystic pathology is 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 not it's not really understood why that predominates in the, in the lung, uh, in the kidney, in the, to some extent in the thyroid with the cystic lesions. Uh, I don't think anybody knows what the I mean, there could be a common I guess a common microbiome, but you know cysts have multiple causes, don't they? Um, I I don't really honestly I don't think I honestly can give you an intelligent answer, unfortunately. Okay. That's um, a great David, question. Yeah. David Rosenblatt asked, and the question was answered, but I want to bring it up nonetheless. Uh, why medical genetics was asked in a nine month old with leukemia where they had any dysmorphic features? And we're told there were no dysmorphic features, but it was the type of leukemia, right. uh, this JMML. So, my yeah. question to you, sort of as a, you know, as a final parting question, you have a lot of uh, people here from the Department of Medicines from different subspecialties. Mm. Are, is there any message you want to give this whole group about people we should be looking out for that we should be referring to your team? Um, well, I mean, a broader question of which people may, may have mosaicism, I suppose, and what difference would it make? I think, I think um, you know, the list of conditions that, that, that JB went through, any, but any child with any of those conditions clearly um, is going, probably going to get in genetic. I guess the question is um, in adults. What, this is primarily yeah, adults. Exactly so, in, in adults. adults. So, so I think you'd be looking for for um, for Brett beyond the CH question, which I think we kind of dealt with to a certain extent, um, which would mean essentially testing everybody, right? Um, uh, I guess you'd be looking for phenotypes that um, mainly in the skin, for example, where there would be. Uh, some kind of evidence for a, a change in, in, in skin structure that is not explained, right? So the dermatologists know this pretty well. In terms of, um, you know, respirology or, as you say, cardiology or other, other aspects of general medicine, it's a bit harder to know what to specifically look for because the phenotypes are so broad. I mean, as you saw there, a CH can, is associated with infection, uh, it's associated with, with, with heart disease, um, you know, uh, and many other disorders. So I'm not sure I can come up with sort of a plan that would help you identify persons who may have mosaicism, because essentially it's everybody. The real question is, what does it mean clinically? Uh, and can we do anything? And I think 
that's where the preventive aspect could be interesting if we actually did find, for example, I mentioned the MER11A variant earlier. Well, it turns out that that MER11A variant is, is seen in French Canadians, for example, and in the in the in the biobank from Cartagena, you know, we could assay people who have that variant and see what happens to them, that kind of thing. So it'd be more a sense of a sort of an epidemiological study from somebody in the Department of Medicine who's interested in disease causation, perhaps, to, to see whether CH is linked to any of their diseases, rather than identify specific persons who should be referred, because I suspect many of these people are being referred either or be, are being tested directly by dermatologists when they see something like, you know, segmental NF1, they're going to test them or refer them on to Daniel D'Agostino, who's interested in that, and things like that. I, I suspect most of the obvious cases are getting detected, and the unobvious cases are, ju are just too unobvious to know who to test other than everybody. Great, thank you. Just one last point. Are there any research programs that you have ongoing that you would like specific kind of patients referred to in your department, as far as you know? Um, as a well, shout out to help your researchers. Yeah, well, JB, you should come in because you, I mean, we're both interested in this. The, the mosaic, the DICER case came, came through to came through me because I'm interested in DICER syndrome rather than specifically mosaicism, but I've published a number of papers on mosaicism. But maybe JB, you can say something about your, I know you're, you know, you're really the, the leading guy for this on the lab side, particularly. Do you want to have a chance to call out for patients with, with mosaic disorders that you'd like to investigate? No, 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 sim sim simply because I'm too busy with uh, trying to repatriate genomic tests in the clinic. Yeah, out of uh, province. That's this turned out to my... be, uh, yeah, as, as an aside, that's turned out to be, as you can imagine, a huge project because you know, before you were very happy to send tests out and have the government pay for them, uh, it's going to be a lot more difficult when the tests will come back to us because we have to report them on, on all the tests. And um, my sense of this is this, this is a cost saving uh, measure. This is not to do with that we, the test should be done in-house, it's trying to save money. So there's going to be all sorts of limitations, I suspect, on what test you can order. So the days of sending everybody you want to offer a test may well be coming to an end. Ironically, when we should, you, know, you could argue we should be testing more people, may it be tended to testing less. In terms of research projects on my end, I mean, anybody, um, yeah, I think anything that, you know, we're, I mentioned multiple primary tumors. So anybody with a multiple primary tumor without a family history, you have to wonder about mosaicism, right? Because that's a message that came across from the DICE aspect. So I think patients with, with not obvious multiple primary tumors, like if they have breast and ovarian cancer, it's going to be BRCA1 or something like that. Whereas if they have an unusual combination of multiple primary tumors, um, or sequencing has been done and it's been negative, then I would be definitely interested to see those patients and try to work out what the matter with them is. And we have a project with my um, student, Fiona, who is sequencing these cases now and you know, sequencing the normal tissue, the tumor tissue, the blood of, you know, of, of you know, multiple tumors from the same person and then aligning them up like we did with the dice of things and well, what's common? And maybe that way we'll find what, what the contribution to these uh, multiple primary tumors was. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Fascinating, fascinating work and, and presentation. Thank you for sharing this with us. I'd like to thank everyone for participating and I wish everyone a great afternoon. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank bye you, Nadia. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.